The Square Ball Podcast. Well, hello to you and welcome to The West Stand. It's our new show that's out at the start and the end of the week, usually. Um, may mix that up a little bit when we start facing the likes of Norwich and Sunderland in the next week or so, but we will get to that in due course. Guests from across the world of Leeds United, be it journalists, commentators, ex-players and, and more, people who notionally inhabit The West Stand. I'm Dan Moylan. With me is Michael Normanton. Hello. Hello. And an inhabitant of the West Sand today, and kit designer, and any other label you want to attach to yourself, Ed Cowburn. Welcome back to the show, Ed. Hello. So for anybody who doesn't know, you designed last season's kits. Yes, the Peacocks. The failure kits. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, the home kit with the, the blue, yellow, blue. Beautiful. Yep. The, the away kit that became cursed, the Peacock kit, but I think is the best kit we've had up to that point still seeing a lot of those out and about in many um, a year I, I think that's going to go well with age that one it's mm. going to age well and look, then, forward, look forward to seeing the retro version from score drawer in about what 10 years 15 years mm. and there's, there's nothing like as good no and of course the rhubarb and custard which is divided opinion yeah i think that i think that's a good thing i think anything that you know starts conversation is um is a, a bit of a winner and um you know you, you couldn't get it in kids sizes very quickly um, but I'm sure we'll get to, you know, availability of product <laughs> down the line. So, Yeah, so you did the uh, the Adidas kits for last year um, through your company, Acid FC. Yes. So you did it, you spent a year doing stuff with Leeds United. Um, yeah, so we, we did we did the kits about 18 months out and then um, I was actually brought in and employed just as me um, as a creative consultant, shall we say. For, that sounds wanky, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I like it though. Um, and with the retail team, so there was a few things that I got my fingerprints on. Um, well, the, the peacocky tracksuit was that you? Uh, yeah, so that was part of the stuff that we did with the kits, um, the full peacock print tracksuit and the training stuff and all that. But then there was um, I was involved in the what's it called the varsity range. That's it, your fault. That was like a rugby <laughs> shirt and a cricket shirt, a cricket jumper and a, a jacket similar to the one I'm wearing, but with Legion United that is the same graphic that you now see on the East End. Um, and there's a few other graphics around the northeast corner and in the sh- store that I kind of, you know, was involved with. And um, and there was another, we, we did the Acid FC um, collaboration. It's like streetwear and things like that. And that's what sort of Acid FC has kind of become. So I've worked with other other clubs since Leeds. So um, you're a gun for yeah. hire. I'm a gun for hire, and we're in you know in the process of kind of. Or I suppose it, it gives me an interesting kind of perspective since we did that kind of deep dive. Is that I've worked with other clubs, so kind of seeing what it's like, you know, not just being a Leeds fan working with with Leeds United, you know, work, working with other clubs and seeing if it's the same um, madhouse, um, shall we say? Um, and it's yeah, it's it, perspective and. Uh, the, that appreciation is has become kind of key to my work. You so. can you can find the um, the deep dives that Ed just referenced there, back in the channel YouTube podcast as well, where we, we we took a dive into the design, the overall design process, and we did the three kits that you um, that you got your sticky fingers on. Let's not talk about that now because it's available for people to go back watch, listen to if you want to. Let's talk about the here and now and um, a yellow away shirt that I think. Oh, let me put this to you then. Do you agree? It's the best, we're the best dressed football team in the country in that away kit this season. Yeah, away away from Allen Road, we are the best looking um, team in the country for sure. And it, you know, it's it's funny, isn't it? We we spoke about this, but what three months ago, two months ago, before it came out, and we were we were all hoping, and um, the sales have been amazing. It looks amazing. We've actually won in it twice. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, no, I, th- I think they've absolutely, you know, smashed it. Mm. It's a it's a fantastic kit, isn't it? And it's just those little tweaks the the smile, the addition of the smiley badge, the shoulder detailing that has just elevated it from a standard yellow away kit, which doesn't sell according to the data. According <laughs> to Angus Kinnear, doesn't sell. But to be fair, he's he's held his hands up with that. But it just goes to show that there are yellow kits, and then there are yellow kits that have little magical touches on them that set them apart and the heritage and the storytelling specifically as what has set that one apart maybe not the fabric a bit, a bit bobbly not one to wear with goalkeeper gloves no is what, is what i'm picking or, up or with seat belts <laughs> oh, so what are you advocating here 
<laughs> no, I've I've, um, I've read a few things on um, on social media um, where you know people have you know had problems with their with their shirts, which is never a good look. But mm. yeah, a bit unfortunate. Oh, yeah, maybe it's just sure. we're just one of those years, one of those materials where they've gone, oh, that'll be quite nice, and it's not quite worked out. What's funny is because as a kid, I used to wear football shirts pretty much all the time, lead shirts primarily. But it was strange how some fabrics were incredibly prone to it and others like the um i always remember the the half and half yes like 97 98 Asics, one. the Essex one um it was puma puma it was puma that was impossible to get a pull on because of right. the type of fabric it was really it was really hard wearing it was like you got very small bobbles all over it but it was in, you your goalkeeper gloves never never pulled a big old string out of it what are you doing nice. wearing an outfield shirt and goalkeeper gloves anyway Three and in at the park, isn't it? I wanted, you, I wanted got, to see everyone's you. got to do this thing. <laughs> I wanted to see you in a full goalkeeper's outfit with padded elbows, like the 1980s. I, I did have a few of them, which ironically were terrible. I've got a Republic of Ireland one and a Lazio one, weirdly, from the time. I just used to buy whatever shit was in JJB Sports. They were terrible for it. You, they'd, they'd fall apart with a bit of Velcro. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if this lot don't seem particularly hard wearing, that is a bit of a shame because it's a sort of shirt as well that you, you can imagine you would like to keep for. for yeah, well, I, my, my lads. Um, nearly 11 and um obviously i said to him you know do you want one of the shirts for this season and obviously first thing he said well you know they're not as good as the ones that you did dad but um good boy here's five pounds yeah exactly um but he well he wants the yellow one um and the the, the question is and this is quite an interesting one is he quite wants it with red bull on the front he wants the a proper player one so i've got to you know dip into um getting him a, a small men's rather than a kid's one oh, that's interesting so from my point of view I think it would look so much better without the sponsor on. But then in previous years, I, I know I've I've thought in the past when they've had a different, when it's been a bookmaker or whatever, and the kids kids have had a different sponsor on. I've thought as a kid, it would have annoyed me to not have the same version as the players because it's like that's that's part of it, isn't it? Is yeah. that you're going? And in my day, you could proudly have strong bow on your chest even though you were 16 years old. And I think as well, we have to acknowledge that the concerns around club identity that us legacy fans might have where Red Bull are concerned are probably not shared by kids under the age of 12 to 13. Um, they just want it to look cool. From his yeah. point of view, does he want it because that's the version that the players wear or does he want it because he thinks Red Bull looks cool on there? Well, ne next week, you should, you should have him on and um, <laughs> game where he's, you know, on the West End. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, th I think it, it, it it's the player thing. It's the that's the real McCoy. That's that's the thing mm. that they're wearing. You, you want to look like I your idols. Like, yeah, I want to look like what we see on the TV and on the pitch. So, yeah, no, that does make total sense. Total I, sense. I want to look like look like Max Verber. Right. So, right. You know, it's, it's why the, so the kids know, are all saying <laughs> they also want um, you know the badges mm. on the on the on the arms and you know a name set and all that and you know get saving your pocket money. <laughs> Last time you were on, you were advocating the smiley badge to just be our badge yes. for everything. What do you think of the exact variant that they've used on it? Because there have been a few different options they could have gone for. Um, I I think it's a bit big, mm. is one thing, and I think it is very round. You know, <laughs> in terms of you know, you know what I'm saying. The the, the 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 alternative we're talking about is that one that's kind of got a slightly squared box inside it, where yeah. the the yellow fits, and I think it, that's better because I think that just a bit of extra blue just. I don't know, it gives it a little bit more of a badge sense. It's, more, you know it's I mean. more defined. Yeah, at the moment it feels like it's just, a you know, if you're from a distance, it's just a massive circle with, you know, the the, the, the outlines in the, in the middle rather than, you know, that bit of extra, I think, gives it a little bit more gravitas. But that's the one that they were sort of faithfully referring back to on the shirt that they've used as source yeah. material, I believe, haven't they? So it's actually yeah. historically accurate, even if it's not the best version of the smiley. So. Yeah. We just want we want absolute perfection, don't we? In these things, like yeah, and, and, and that's good. That's allowed. We're allowed to, you know, have those opinions and um, really push for them. Yeah, the home kit this year, a bit disappointing <laughs> to me. It's just it strikes me as generic Adidas template, and I know that um, the the blue swoops on it are uh, they just feel a little bit meh to me. A little bit. I'm a little bit indifferent to them. They're a bit big. Um, you, I mean, you can tell the difference, can't you? The fact that you see the yellow kit a lot more than the home kit this season. Yeah. Um, and you know, f for me, especially yesterday, I, I shared with you yesterday, and I the, the new Boca Juniors third kit is basically how it should be. It's got the blue, yellow, blue added stripes, and on the on those flash points, sort of around the back, it's blue, yellow, blue in it. Well, this is funny, you know, Ed, you because know. I think it's possibly a bit too much that Boca's yeah. that Boca Juniors kit. Yeah, I think because it's got the alternate 
stripes on the shoulder. It's also got a band around the middle, like the 93-94 home kit, yep. which obviously caused scandal at the time. But I reckon that's probably not far off a, a retro reboot um, from a Leeds home kit point of view. And then you've got the swoops down the sides. I think the, it probably doesn't need both I of those think, things. Yeah, does it? I think the shoulders and round the chest and the swoops that go around the torso as well. I think they're too much. Fair. And and it's what is it the uh, the sponsor is? Is it Betson? So close to Beeston. I know. Oh, <laughs> like I can't believe I didn't notice that. There's a, there's a guy on um, on Instagram that um, that will take your shirt and take off the sponsor and put uh, an old school sponsor. Um, if you if you ask him nicely, and I think that that will, I might have to do that with that Boca Juniors one. So back in the Macron days, the sponsor just would just come off it organically, would. wouldn't yeah, it? Just wash which was... it at forty degrees. Yeah. See you later. There you go. <laughs> Done and dusted. You could do it yourself. <laughs> Save yourself some money. <laughs> uh, but the Adidas Originals range has, has come out this year as well, which I think is really cool. Like I've seen so many people knocking about wearing this and some like some variations on it hoodies that are using a deeper blue and just playing with the color palette a little bit. Oh, they're all pretty impressive, and I think the only criticism you could level about any of that is they didn't order enough of it by the looks of it yeah it seems that way i mean um uh, we, we, we were chatting before um and I, w- I wonder whether it's because of the smiley the smiley is doing a lot of the heavy lifting on it and it just looks great um i hope so because it fits in with my uh, narrative of wanting it um to be used more because if you look back i think in last season um maybe the season before there was the icons range by adidas that had the kind of big stripes up the side panel uh, up your body oh it's um, the, the three big stripes it reminds yeah, me of the, old the, Liv- the liverpool kit. yeah it's like the adidas equipment era and, and uh, um sweden thomas Brolin. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly and and i think you can still get hold of that so that that hasn't really done the job whereas this you know even with you know people complain about the pot prices um that doesn't seem to have held anybody back with this range and it's it's absolutely flown so I'm sure you've described there though they did use the wrong yellow on that they did for some reason mm, it was a bit it was a bit light wasn't it yeah it was very washed out sort mm. of yellow on it for some reason and um, what do you make of the overall kit situation across um across the country at the minute and in the championship um there's actually not very many of the the big manufacturers knocking about in the championship we've got a graphic here on um on our little prep sheet and i wasn't aware that like macron i've got a fairly firm foothold in their area as well um who i always associate historically with middlesbrough and they're doing their shirts this yeah, year and they're, they're doing Sheffield United as well. Millwall, yeah. QPR, yeah, yeah. 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 I, th- I think um, you're seeing a, t- a trend generally across k- uh, kit designs and kit manufacturers is um, the lower down you go, you tend to get more customization. It's, the, the smaller clubs are really kind of pushing design, I think, perhaps a bit, a bit more than, you know, the upper levels, um, which is which is great. Um there's a couple that kind of stand out lower down, which is Cambridge United, which is worth checking. It's like covered in flowers and stuff. It looks looks amazing. Um, I think for the championship, the ones that stand out are, I think Bristol City have got a pretty wild um, goalkeeper shirt. Um, I'm not sure how well that would have gone down with Leeds fans, but <laughs> I mean, I'm a bit, I'm a big believer in, you know, goalkeepers should get something custom and you should be have a bit of fun with it but then again that's a, a legacy fan would say that won't we so. yeah i'm all for an insane goalkeeper's kit yeah although i would bring back padding right even even though pictures these days clearly don't require it but if you if you played in goal these days though i'd, I'd want that padding yeah i like, don't like it, it used to be a thing it was always makes a, a lot of sense yeah big padding on the you, you got it at the shoulders didn't you well i was yeah. gonna say i remember like one of my first kit obviously i had the, the 1987 white with the um the triangles around the chest and the central badge the, the Leeds kit but around that time I also had I think it was the it was purple and silver Umbro goalkeepers kit and I looked like a character out of like Dallas or Dynasty with the shoulder pads <laughs> it's been Merv- Mervyn Day yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. but I had elbow pads as well they yeah. used to have a, a, like, a weird quilt effect on as well didn't the goalkeeper shirts as if like we know you're not running about as much so we put an extra bit of uh, bit of layer but keep warm <laughs> yeah put a bit of extra yeah, you're, you're likely to be di- diving around in mud and water yeah, so absorb all that in your big thick shirt. <laughs> you just one big sponge. Because even even up to like the late nineties, um, you know, Nigel Martin had padding mm. on those shirts. Is that, this seems like it's only been in the last maybe fifteen years that that's not a thing anymore. And it's gone to base layers and short sleeve shirts now as well. So there's no protection for Elon Melier's spindly elbows. I know. So it's amazing that he's still not broken. I just put the mockers on that, haven't I? Here's one question for you. Third kit. We're never going to see that, are we? I because I think. The yellow kit, in the same way that your cursed um, peacock shirt got 
dispensed with Ed. So I'm, I'm using emotive language now just for dramatic effect. But we do know, I think, from the way that the team didn't want to wear the blue kit, probably um, towards the last stages of last season because they hadn't won in it. I think the opposite thing might be happening this season with the yellow kit. Are they going to want to wear the blue third or are they going to have to do for contractual have you, have reasons? You, have you done your deep dive into what games that they could wear that third kit? Well, there's absolutely no need to have the third kit mm. at Will Leeds this season because all white or all yellow doesn't clash with anybody. No, exactly. I, I, I can't think of a single game where it, there's any point. Well, that, it was often the case when Leeds only had two kits where you had an all white and an all yellow and that's all you needed. Mm. Um, so we know that it can go up again. I can't think of anybody we could face that we, where we'd need to change out of those two. But for, you know, whatever reasons. I, mean, I suppose like they might want to, when we play Swansea, for example, who play in all white to offer a bit more contrast, you wear the blue kit. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it, it strikes me as generic Red Bull with the sponsor on it. Whereas I quite, I, when I saw it originally, I saw the bus seat reinvented. Um, I was around when um, when some of the kits were um, being discussed and this idea of by doing something kind of modern and, you know, bold and, you know, vibrant and, you know, maybe sort of touching on kind of, I don't know, nightclubs and, you know. That neon, it's neon, neon and yeah. yeah, lasers and that kind of thing. Um, I, I don't think it's fallen particularly well in terms of if you look at what Puma have done with the two um, Red Bull clubs and their third kits, because if you put all of them together, they almost look identical, um, and pro- mainly probably because of the Red Bull logo being on it. But it's this, this dark blues with flashes of colour. So it kind of, unfortunately, I feel as if it's been lumped in with those rather than given a, an opportunity to live on its own merits mm. um but which, which also it, don't... It, it doesn't it, 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 it's fine I, you know it doesn't really blow me away you know I, 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 I you know, as you know from the m- amount of time that we spent talking about the peacock <laughs> stuff i do a deep dive i like to have hidden meanings and you know stuff really let people dig deep into what a, what a kit is and you d- you don't get that with with um with the home kit or with the third and that's fine because that's actually what 95 percent of kits are as a, ba- as a base graphic it could just it's a windows screensaver isn't it that, <laughs> yeah. as, as a, like there's nothing there's it, nothing leadsy about it there's yeah. nothing particularly revolutionary about it design wise it's just got some blue in it yeah and it's it, just a, it's just a thing and there's no reason why when you're putting a design like that together that you couldn't go well let's at least you know have it reference some of the pylons on the east stand or you know th- that kind of thing and i think that's the bit where i just go just push it a little bit harder and you know make it feel it's ours rather than generic what i was going to say before sorry when i was talking over you i was just going to say because you provoked a thought in me which was um analyzing it on its own merits but they're never going to stand up to the analysis of the awake the awake is like it's a behemoth, isn't it? Because yeah. it's been so de- like desired. The yellow kit has been so desired and it's been executed so well that the, the other two almost like pale into its shadow. So mm-hmm. what's the, what's even the point? Yeah, no, this this season, you know, to, back to your point, are we the best looking, you know, if that, that away kit does all that heavy lifting, all that hard work, and it is true. It looks fabulous. I think the problem with the home shirt as well this year is it's not the best white lead shirt this season because we've all seen the, the Adidas one with the smiley on, which could... It could have worked as a imagine that as a home yeah. kit. No, I know, I agree. And so you see that, and you go, "Oh, it was so close." Yeah. If only we'd had that too. But, but you know, see what they do in, in future years as well, because they've obviously might got a taste for it now and seen the success. I mean, it. we also know as well that there's um, a lot of strategic positioning from the sponsors in terms. So I'm talking about Adidas, and you know the way that they're using the trefoil um, on certain certain things. Um, their top tier clubs have got a third kit that's got that on it, but um, we don't fall into that bracket. And therefore, you know, it, it, they can't do it. I'm, I've seen some leaks of Liverpool are in Adidas next season, and they've got, um, by all accounts, like a green away kit that's got the trefoil on it. That's you know, looks extremely retro. Great for the colour blind that using green as an alternative to red. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, and and then you know, the, yeah, the way the way that they're kind of pushing on nostalgia, I think, is a really interesting um, area to to think about is is that a good thing and how often do you use it and i think over the last few years i kind of feel the general state this season with kits is a little bit um a bit too nostalgic there's a bit too much retro going on is that then- is that being led though by the sort of wider fashion for and i and i'm 
mindful of my own age in this and participating in it first time round. Like nineties revivalism seems to be quite big at the minute. Oh, it's huge. Like Adidas Sambas are huge, you know, like and Bucket Hats have obviously made a massive comeback. And it's across the fashion as well. The Oasis you, have made a comeback. Yeah. <laughs> and and you, you but you're seeing it kind of this, you know, if you read flash fashion blogs and stuff and you know, people are going on about bloke core and and that, you know, you've got Drake and Rihanna wearing kind of or oh, you know the Kardashians wearing Roma shirts from 1994 and things like this, and um, it's not going away. And then you look at someone like Classic Football shirts, who you know have got massive investment. Um, so the, the 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 eye on nostalgia is 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 massive. But I think as an industry, they've got to work out where that fits in with also pushing things forward because surely it ends up eating itself. Because in 20 years, if we're doing a retro of a retro then it, it, that doesn't work anymore. You've still got to be producing kind of new things to sort of, you know, be able to be able to push the envelope. In terms of producing new things, then let's move into talking about the West Stand. And it's worth adding to what we said about what you did at the start is that you are a 49ers fan. You were a 49ers fan before all, all this started. You've been to Levi's Stadium and the name of the show is the West Stand. We're getting a new one soon. Yes. Don't know when. Yep, don't know where. We, I think we do we know, where. We know where. Yeah, just about. Um, be, over and above and behind and round. Yep. Um, Can't wait. And a, and a new cop. So um, your thoughts on that as a West Stand inhabitant now? Um, um, as if there's quite a lot to unpack, isn't there? Probably, um, I don't know if we, we ever mentioned that with a 49ers fan. I can't remember. Um, yeah, that's been an interesting kind of journey just to add to the mix. But um, yeah, West Stand. Um, yeah, you mentioned it a lot. It's that feeling never changes walking up the steps because it's the first, I, I, I don't think I walk up the same set of steps that I walked up in 1985, but that feeling when you walk out and you see the pitch is still the same. Um, funnily enough, the West End is still the same. Yeah. Um, I've sat sort of across the West End. I feel like I've had a lot of emotions there. I've learned a lot of swearing there. My son's now learning all there is to know about the English <laughs> language there. Um, we moved seat for this season uh, to be slightly more towards the centre, only to realise that we're now under the one of the next to one of the main pillars holding up the gantry, and it's massive. And we miss out probably about five or six yards of, <laughs> of the middle of the pitch. Um, and change cut comes soon enough, right? You know, it's it's. It's lovely, but it's well overdue. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I'm I'm really hoping that they start to move things forward. Whatever happens, whether it's promotion or the Premier League, because it, it, you know, it's not fit for purpose. I think it tells a story that, and I'm, admittedly, it's like nearly 15 years old now. But the King's Speech, that movie at the start when he walks out, and they needed a relic of a stadium to represent the old Wembley. What did they use? Is that true? The West Stand, mm -hmm. yeah. If you if you oh, look at that, that, when he's he's underneath the stand just before he comes up um, out of the stairs. There's, there's uh, some shots in the stadium as well, aren't there? Yeah, so the ones facing backwards into the stand mm -hmm. are quite clearly the West Stand, but obviously they're, they're then CGI as as they you know gets a front view towards the crowd. It's old Wembley, but they used the West Stand to to film that. Yeah, and uh, that tells you a story that it's going back so many so many, many decades. We've got to work out a way of keeping part of it, put it into a museum so that movies in the future can use use it for this purpose and and that hopefully is something the 49ers are thinking of another you know bit of money um spinning <laughs> that they can do i mean speaking of money spinning levi stadium i dare say makes it an absolute bloody fortune not, not levi's solicitors no no I must add great bunch of lads and lasses <laughs> they make a good amount of money but they don't rip anyone off that's the good thing about those guys. They charge a very, they charge a very reasonable amount for everything. What? What? Bring an endorsement. They're not even sponsoring the show. <laughs> Sorry, that's but my fault. Levi's Stadium. You've been. Yes, um, I have. What yeah. do you make of it? There, there, um, was, there are criticisms around it, it being open air um, in Santa Clara, and it's because the original design they had, I think, for the Bay Area, not the Bay Area, for actually San Francisco itself, for the Bay up there. They fell out with the council, so they moved the whole design wholesale south. Yep, into the sun. Yep, it's uh, it was it was a, an amazing experience, and it's with the only time I've been to an American football game game in in the US, and that comes with a load of weirdness that is like you, you know 
sitting in a car park and drinking beers and seeing people throw American footballs about. Well, and... it's, it's the tailgate party. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then sort of going into the stadium and it feeling like, um, I suppose the, the closest I could I, I could look at it from a British perspective is, you know, the experience of Wembley. Um, it's just really polished. Um, and you've got an app that works and you can order food at your seat. But you know, the, but the, the the game is very different, isn't it? It's not you, it, to try and compare it to to uh, football here. You know, you've got lots of natural breaks in the play. You know, the way that um, a crowd interacts with what's going on on the pitch is very different. Um, you you jump around and you shout when it's a defen- defensive period, and you stay quiet waiting for action when it's an attacking period and then you cheer when something good happens which you know is like totally the reverse of how how we interact with the sport our sport um but you know it's it's good but as and i suppose i was the tourist i was the the person that we hope we don't see many of um and i did i did pay play pay for the pleasure um massively over the odds because it was the first season that they were, they were there as well just to but, upset me what sort of money we're we talking uh, I think I paid over 300 quid a ticket. Right. <sighs> but, you know, I, I've not been to San Francisco very much and I thought I, I really want to see a game. And so, yeah, I paid for the privilege. It is interesting, actually, thinking about the shoe being on the other foot in that regard, is that we must have all done it at some point, done something a bit touristy like that. Oh, you, I, I kind of hated myself for it, but, yeah. you know, and, and they you, lost as well. And yet, and yet <laughs> as, the, as, the, as, the resident, as the resident legacy fans, you go, well, I kind of don't want that. I don't want that to dilute the atmosphere. Although you did say when we spoke earlier this week, Mike, actually, there is a place for tourists in Ellen Road and it probably is the new West Stand in the premium GA mm-hmm. seats to use a Um But as long as the rest of it can maintain something resembling the original feel of it or... The original inhabitants of it are there to recreate that. There are tourists, not and, there are, and there are tourists as well, because there are people who will come over from Ireland for two games a season, but who are Leeds fans going back generations in some cases, and that's different than someone who just happens to be in Leeds and wants to see a game. Which and happens it, a lot with West Ham, doesn't it? I think in their stadium they get a lot because yeah. it's London. Like it's a different. That's a very different experience you're describing between those two people. Someone who is who is a Leeds fan and someone who is just going to a game and could, and if they were in. Yeah, if they're in London, they might have gone to Fulham, but they're in Leeds, so they've gone to see. I was just, Leeds. I was just going to say the same thing. That's exactly how I kind of, you know, felt when I was over there watching a game. Um, you know, I was there to really participate and be part of it, and mm. you really enjoy the experience. Where you know, and that, and that's what you want. Mm. You know, yeah, you've said it on a, a pod, um, a couple of episodes about you know that American fan who you know you were saying advocating come over. That's that's what you want. You want those people that you know to to come over and experience it and join the madness. It's weird the experience of a tourist because I've been to games abroad, but I feel weirdly like having been to hundreds of games in this country and not got because I always will just buy the cheapest seat available as well. <laughs> I feel like I'm almost not a tourist, which I'm aware I actually am. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost like I felt I've the done, same. I've done my time. Yeah, yeah, I've been to like Barcelona to the new camp, and I think I remember buying like a nine euro ticket or something like that, and we were basically up in the clouds. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you feel. But you feel. I think you feel like you've earned it. You've yeah. earned your stripes because you've you've done your time at Ellen Road, and you, you you almost want to say to the people around you, "Yes, I am here visiting from out of town, but I do go to loads of football. I understand this. I'm not just here for Messi, the new camp, Ronaldinho, whatever it might have been." Well, I'm I'm doing some work at the moment with um, a non-league Scottish team, Caledonia Braves, who are a kind of crowdfunded team. They're, they're doing really cool stuff and um, helping them out as a creative director. Um, and I was up in Scotland um, three weeks ago, a month ago, and they were playing Berwick Rangers, which I was in Scotland and that's in England. It's a, mm. a, a, a bit of a weirdness. And I took my lad there and there was about 150 people there. And I absolutely loved it. You know, just I, I love going to football stadiums and seeing it. And I was a tourist and he just sort of, you know, s- stood on the terraces. It was a lovely day as well. And the same level of upset and anger <laughs> and swearing. And uh, there was one point um, where a bloke just went, asshole! <laughs> 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 and my lad just thought it was the funniest thing. And I was like, this, this is, these are my people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I am as irrational as you are about this, except I'm just here to watch you do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it'll be interesting to see what bits they bring from Levi's Stadium 
and try and implement at Ellen Road. Like you say, it's it's a vastly different cultural experience, um, NFL versus um, hopefully Premier League by that time. And you suspect it will be Premier League that you know causes the the West End to be um, to be done. Like I I know that it was mentioned about they thought about not putting Wi-Fi in and stuff like that because they don't want Leeds fans to be on their phones, you know, filming stuff. It's like, but you don't need. You don't need Wi-Fi to film stuff on your phones. We don't do that because we don't no. want, we don't want to. But it's actually, Wi-Fi might just help in terms of like checking scores, mad shit like that. You know, all the stuff people try to do and just don't bother anymore. Or occasionally just like messaging your mate to say where you're going afterwards, but because WhatsApp doesn't work, you kind of have going, fuck's sake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you know, it, you know, make make sure you teach your kids not to play on the phones at the game. I mean, you know, what yeah. kind of parents are you? Yes. Oh, they could they could give those little bags out that they give at concerts these days, where you got to put your uh, you got to put your phone in the bag. <laughs> And secure it away. Feels a bit much. A bit, a bit prison camping. That's a bit too much. What, where, what do you think they do with away fans? You know, in the in the West End, do you think that's where they they they're always going to live now? Because obviously, in our lifetime, they've kind of moved about. You know, of of the away fans. And for I was thinking before coming on that when I first went in the West End, I was up kind of where the away fans are now. Mm. Um, because my my. We knew Bobby Collins and their family, and he often would get his tickets. And I remember as a kid going into the, was it? I can't remember what it's called. The bar, the, the sort of executive bar under the West End back in the eighties. And you know, I, I met John Charles and and Bobby and stuff. And it was like, you know, I think my dad was just speechless whenever he saw him. Yeah, uh, it was incredible. And you know, that's. That even in that's the that's the only change that it feels like in my in my lifetime that's happened in the West End is is that that's kind of gone and then the, now the away fans are there. I've got a feeling it'll be south towards Cheese Wedge again. They'll end up back over there. I mean, if we're going to move them to the worst bit of the ground, East Stand is the ob- the more obvious spot for it because it's it's pretty shit. What upper? Well, no, because you've got to be pitch side, haven't you? Yes, yeah, so that's one of the rules. Be, but unless you're, unless you're Newcastle. Because I don't want to surrender the ends because I used to hate away fans in the South Stand. Plus, that's that's too big, essentially. We don't need to give away fans that many tickets, particularly if they're putting more West Stand boxes in. There's always the talk that they'll take the South Stand back to the original where you get a few more rows of seats in the back, in which case that becomes a decent end. So I wouldn't want to surrender the ends. But it's how you bring them in, isn't it, I suppose? Because the West Stand kind of works because the car park's behind it and you can... The, take them through the, the gulag <laughs> the, the, the concrete yeah and you, and you can, you, i think you kind of want you want the raucous home fans on either side of the away fans to really give them mm. some shit like it you? is in the west stand at the minute you mean well, well exactly because you know i i, I, I went into i think I, I got a ticket or some of the hospitality thing of um a couple of years ago and was it was quite close to the away fans and um there's no they're not getting enough grief mm. You know, and I don't know how you how you can kind of bring that in. And that, that actually reminds me. I remember, I, or you, I forgot how there's an area of the West End that the first, I think the first exit by the away fans, where you kind of go through the original manager's office, um, sort of in uh, by the main sort of West End old uh, reception area, and it's still got the old wooden doors, and it's kind of wood panelled, and there's a wood a small wood panelled sort of stairwell going up and they've got pictures of like the Champions League and you know bits and pieces but then you come out and then you have to walk like what feels like another 50 yards I think Simon mentioned this when he was on the other week you have to walk miles to get to your seat because the entrances are just not in the right place it is yeah it's bonkers it's a mad fire hazard I have to say when I was in I was in there for the um for the cup game against Middlesbrough I, I very rarely go in it but I thought I'd not bought a ticket I thought I'll just go wherever really and kind of fancy a different perspective on a game now and then as well and just the way it's set up inside is just really, really confusing. Like, it, there's, yeah. there's no, you kind of know the logic of a of a modern stadium, don't you? Where you go in, there's a big open space essentially underneath it where there's bars and stuff, but it's all as one. It feels and like you a series walk, of corridors. And you can walk through it. Mm. As the West Stand's like, you go up, you go down, then you have to go across, then you, <laughs> it's just all, all really weirdly stuck together. I hope, I hope they keep, when they, when they do change it, I hope they keep that kind of um, the north west corner where there's all the windows kind of looking out over the car park i always quite like that so yeah. the greenhouse uh, yeah you're having a having a pint and looking out over there and sort of you know where all the players cars I and think it's it, it's all gonna go isn't it and of course it's, the it's northeast corner i like the northeast corner for that as well because it was always the first bit of the ground you saw when you could obviously put people, people. In, people in the window yeah. like, having pints and i always used to think oh it looks good it's all gonna go it's all gonna go I think I think just to answer the question, they'll put the fans. It'll be either Cheese Wedge and a bit of South, or maybe 
south over towards where they're sat mm. now. So it's yeah, people are not going to like it, but it's it's the only place logically I think you could probably put two to three thousand people. Sadly, but yeah, you know, sadly, but I I do think they they need to be surrounded a bit more. So that I'm, I I kind of feel that that could help an atmosphere because I know there's been a lot of chat about you know what happens with the atmosphere when you know when this changes do happen. Who knows? Let's yeah. just be good on the pitch. The problem with the south stand itself is that it's not quite big enough to do the job on its own. So you're kind of going to have to um, give them all of it to accommodate the number of tickets you've got to give away fans, mm. if that makes sense. So you but can't. I suppose when yeah. Middlesbrough in it recently, they had they had West and a bit of the South, didn't they, for that cup game? Yeah. Fact. Yeah. So whether or not they do something like I that, I just but... can't imagine they're going to give the newest stand in the ground, the premium stand no. to away no, fans. No, because no. That's why I mentioned it. Especially if it's if it's capped at whatever price. Um, just back Get to, them in those cramped lower east lower seats. <laughs> just back to the present day anyway. I was going to say we've got um, we've got Coventry um, at the weekend who I'm just looking at their suite of kits and they're back with um, with Hummel. Which yeah, I was, they've, they've been with Hummel a few years actually. Yeah, um, I've, I've always mentally I think associated Coventry as, as being with Hummel. It's a, it, they're a, it's a good fit I think for them. Were they Hummel in '87? Apart from then, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was that was that was. I think I'd say that that was probably my first r- real sense of loss. Yeah, it's the first time. I, the first time I cried at a football match. That I think was the semi-final defeat, and then for a second time in the playoff final defeat at Birmingham. So let's go and absolutely thump them just to because every year it makes me think about that. Yeah, on that basis, I'm just having a look at their kit. I think. I can't quite tell from the thumbnail that I've got, but it looks, yeah, it looks like um, a Hummel kit. But um, their home kit, obviously sky blue, I presume they're not going to be in that. They're not going to be in their away kit because it's white. I think they launched the black and gold kit this yeah, week, which usually like a, makes me think that they're going to wear it. So Almost looks like a um, Venezia kit. Yes. It's a pretty cool um, pretty cool outfit, actually. Uh, it's It's got a, the checkerboard pattern in it, but it's just two shades of black, whereas last year they were in the red and black checkerboard pattern. Again, it's something that, which is something I always associate with Coventry. Yeah, I think they, they, uh, the uh, last few years they've played with the kind of scar history of um, Coventry being where the specials are from. Uh, um, so I think they've almost like taken that checkerboard thing and sort of made it their own a few times. There is there, They did do a special edition scar uh, shirt about four or five years ago, I want to say. It's worth checking out. Three points for the Whites? hope so. Yeah, should be. You think? Yeah. You don't sound too confident, Ed. <laughs> um, I, well, I, unfortunately, I've missed a, the last couple of games because um, we've had some... Um, my mother-in-law's not been well. She's back on the mend, though, so um, uh, big up, Jenny. Um, um, so my lad went, and I, I did watch the, the Burnley game on TV. Um, I just... I, I get, I've got to the point a little bit where I almost feel that we need to give the opposition the ball. Right. And that that's the way that we need to break, break people down is just, you know, let them have the ball a bit and then we can, you know, take off them and have more <laughs> space to play. If you love something, let it go. Yeah, exactly. And um, I had a weird sense of sort of deja vu watching the Man City Arsenal game last week about, you know, when when you've got some of the best players in the world that are also coming up against the same thing that we've done. It kind of has made me feel a little bit better about the world that if they can't do it and they've got all you know the opportunities and all the players that you can ever want and they can't do it till the 95th minute and stuff is maybe we just need to sort of check ourselves just a little bit mm-hmm. um or yeah just just shoot more <laughs> harder as we all know it works <laughs> well work. to circle back to where we started our leads the the best looking team in the country this season we will be if we win on Saturday, at least in my eyes. 100%. I was just looking, you know, Coventry appear to have been wearing triple S sport when they beat us, which is completely new to me. Ah. They were Umbro the year before, Hummel the year after. But triple S? They, oh, won, they won the FA Cup in triple S. Well, there you go. This is a project for us to go investigate, isn't it? Find wow. out what that was all about. Who were triple S? If you know, get in touch and let us know. Mailbag at the squareball.net. Otherwise, we'll catch up again soon, Adia. Yep. See you Adia. soon. Cheers for coming in. Bye. The Square Ball Podcast.